Hey everyone, we are going to dive into today uh, the group of decapods. Uh, I know we just heard about stomatopoda, um, and while mantis shrimp and stomatopods do kind of deserve their day in the sun, they certainly should be highlighted. Uh, very interesting animals. Decapods make up a, a huge group here of crustacea, like a, a crazy amount. We're obviously not going to be able to cover every species. Uh, that's just too massive to take on. Uh, decapod alone could be a separate four credit class we offer. Um, and, and so there's a lot to tackle. So I don't want to say we're going to skim the surface of them, uh, but, but there's just a lot to keep up with. Uh, and again, hopefully this whole time you're comparing uh, the decapod species we're talking about today with those stomatopod species and understanding and realizing the differences there. So uh, to get started, uh, let's talk about their bow plan, that initial body plan in general, uh, and then we'll get into why that's relevant and important uh, in contrast or in comparison uh, to the stomatopods we talked about earlier. Here we have, um, and again, very relevant to, to keep in mind the, the differences here. Uh, our first three thoracic appendages are maxillopeds, uh, which leaves five pairs of peripods for walking. The big difference here uh, is how the now periopods are modified, uh, whereas opposed to the stomatopod where the maxillopeds themselves are modified. Um, so if we know we're looking at three thoracic appendages and five pairs of locomotory appendages, who can tell me what that means, again, in contrast and in comparison to? Um, so with the stomatopods, we're just gonna see a lot more dedication to their feeding. Um, those frontmost five being the maxillopods for like hunting and feeding and manipulation, um, whereas the decapods are gonna be uh, a lot more dedication to locomotion. Took the words right out of my mouth. It couldn't have said it better. The, and I like the use of the word dedication. Um, the important tool here uh, is that exact word, that the dedication of various limbs to organizing themselves into different appendages, if you will. Um, by all accounts, if you look at your typical lobster species, you're looking at an animal with eight pairs of segmented legs and then big claws. Your novice person's gonna technically, if you break that down, you're looking at an arachnid species, uh, right? You're looking at a weird aquatic spider. Uh, if we know our differences now and we realize that these kelle, um, and just so you guys know, when we have the term Kelle or kelepeds here. CH is always that K sound. Um, you're not going to get kicked out of the club if you say chele or chelepeds. Um, I've heard people say chelicera a lot too, um, or chelicera. It's hard for me to even mispronounce it. Um, the dedication, though, of knowing that a locomotory appendage has adjusted into a modified almost feeding appendage, in this case, the kelle. Uh, that helps us as, let's say you're a marine biologist. Uh, now I know, hey, this is not a stomatopod, uh, where again, as it was mentioned, it's almost the flip or the opposite, uh, where we have five pairs of dedicated maxillopeds or feeding appendages. Here we have the, the opposite uh, with the locomotory appendages. They're what's been modified though into these kelle or kelepeds. Yes, similar in appearance here uh, to what we talked about with stomatopoda. Um, you can just tell though there's something different. Uh, and one of the big things that throws people off is when we, I'll try to highlight it here. Let me get a different color than yellow. Let's go with green. Right here, uh, this throws people off quite a bit. Because uh, here we're looking at what I assume most of you would think is either a shrimp, maybe a prawn. Um, there's so much variation here because we've got such a huge variety of species. 
you're not always going to have that modified first set of walking limbs uh, transformed into that iconic lobster claw that you would see on your plate type thing. Uh, the, it, you know, we'll just save it for later. The, the modifications that occur though, uh, will either transition into that big, again, iconic lobster claw, or they take place with the maxillipeds. It just depends on the species. Again, we've got arguably one of the biggest variety of animals here. So of course we're gonna see differences throughout. There's absolutely no way we're gonna lay a blanket statement down uh, and say everything has a delicious lobster claw. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way, not, not with this insurmountable amount of species. But no matter what, we are looking at uh, five total pairs of periapods. Um, it's just recognizing if or if not they've been modified. With that idea in mind, and I like this picture here, uh, it's a perfect example of what we're talking about. We're talking, of course, 10 footed. Um, with, again, with hopefully the knowledge you've uh, gained after this lecture is over, by all accounts, we're looking at an arachnid. We've got four uh, jointed, segmented arthropod legs. Knowing that this is a locomotory appendage versus, um, let's say, like the raptorial appendage in stomatopoda, uh, we know now that this does still count as a decapod. It's 10 footed. We just have this first pair modified. Decapods in general are grouped into two suborders. Uh, so, again, very high on the taxonomical hierarchy still. Uh, and I apologize, but I didn't create this system. Uh, this is going to be another scenario that I know you've run into throughout your zookeeping career, where even though we've deviated out suborders, uh, we there's like one section uh, that's easy and then one section that has everything else. Uh, these two suborders, uh, Dendobrachiata and Pleosiomata, um, both valuable. We're going to talk a lot more about one than the other because uh, there's a very good chance we'll be working with uh, one of these groups as opposed to probably just eating uh, another one of these groups. Excuse me. Uh, as far as the most general way I can describe this, uh, we're looking at two uh, modalities of separation between them uh, being gill structure and the method of reproduction. Uh, both are very relevant. Um, the gill structure, eh, that one, uh, you, you really need to know what you're looking at as far as like, uh, identifying it as a potential marine biologist if you choose to pursue that career. Uh, the method reproduction is very big though. So we're going to start here uh, with the dendrobranchs. Uh, dendrobranchiata, uh, I have shrimp in quotes here on purpose. Uh, they do not include what we consider true shrimps. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, about the misconception that comes with kind of these common terms. For the most part, and as far as you studying, uh, stick with your dendrobrachiata being prawns. Uh, that's always a safe answer. We know you're right. If you say shrimps and prawns, shrimps, again, probably should be in air quotes um, because they're not our true shrimp. Uh, they're going to have uh, filamentous gills. Uh, so I guess like picture uh, spirit finger version, uh, and they're gonna spawn their eggs into the sea. The reason this is so important, uh, and again, probably just by looking at this picture at the bottom right of your screen, uh, I imagine a lot of people have ideas of what you just call this animal in the wild, but why is the spawning eggs into the sea uh, component involved here? Like what does that become in the ocean? Spawning of eggs into the sea um, not only makes them broadcast spawners, but also it they become zooplankton. Uh, zooplankton. Um, so plankton is typically broken down into phytoplankton and zooplankton, and zooplankton is made up of a lot of different organisms, but mainly 
the spawn of a ton of sea creatures, even sunfish. But in this case, we're talking about prawns and um, crustaceans. So a huge disadvantage also of being a broadcast, or I'm sorry, an advantage of being a broadcast spawner um, is your distribution. Uh, you're likely to be scattered further distances, um, not be in one space to be eaten up by a group of fish or even a single fish. But that is also the disadvantage is um, as you know, fish are swimming by whales, uh, smaller fish, if they can get their mouth open big enough and scoop you in or, you know, I'm sorry, the, the spawn, if they can scoop the eggs or the offspring, the larvae into their mouth, they're, they're going to consume it. But again, that's kind of where it balances because the advantage is it's not in a big cluster in one area, concentrated area. You're, um, again, being distributed through the currents and basically like dispersal rates. So some, sorry, <laughs> some of the, some of the, uh, prawns that, or I'm sorry, some of the larvae that make it through and aren't eaten are able to pass on their genetics in the future. So, I mean, you can spawn it out to sea and a big whale comes by, but chances are you're going to have some little offspring to reproduce and that has gotten missed because of the way that uh, air, I mean, water currents work and the dispersal. Yeah, man, excellent. Um, and I'm so glad the term plankton was used. Uh, they do become platonic creatures. Uh, again, this is kind of like inside baseball on the zookeeping side. But if you go around and ask your general populace, hey, what's plankton look like? They're probably going to tell you something similar to this. Uh, but as was just mentioned, it's larval forms of hundreds of millions of different species. Um, uh, I, I think sunfish was mentioned. Uh, like, I, I can't tell you the vast variety of organisms. And we did hear as well the allusion to uh, both plants and basically animal material. I, I know they're organisms, they're individuals, uh, but I'm going to call them material for right now. That gets filtered up. Uh, again, whales, great example. Everybody calls them filter feeders. Uh, Another term that gets thrown around quite a bit is krill. Uh, and while krill is an individual animal, it's usually made up of multiple living organisms. Uh, there's not just big clouds of krill sitting around and nothing else is going on in the ocean. Uh, krill, plankton, uh, whatever you want to call it, and that idea of a whale swimming through, uh, and I'm glad we used the imagery of the whale's mouth being open, uh, as all these microscopic-ish organisms are consumed into the mouth. Uh, that's where we get that idea of being a filter feeder. And again, this should uh, reference back uh, to that rule of 10% and why it's changed in the ocean. Uh, you are consuming arguably some of the most efficient animals in the world. And that's why we get blue whales, uh, whale sharks, uh, myliobatiforms in the form of uh, manta rays. Like there's no mistaking the fact that all these tiny organisms make up a majority of what kind of runs the system of the ocean. Um, yeah, it's just, there's, again, too many individual topics to cover uh, during a lecture like this, uh, but tons of organisms are making up that plankton crowd uh, that we so iconically just picture as basically little tiny pink popcorn shrimp uh, you'd get from, I don't know, Red Lobster or whatever. This is probably the best image uh, you can have for a prawn um, with the dendrobrakes. Again, we're talking about a lot of species here, uh, and certainly a lot of them have not even been considered to be studied. Uh, so there's, again, no blanket statement. Uh, but one of the things we usually look for in a prawn is an overhanging, almost shield, um, the cephalothorax basically extends uh, out, sometimes across, over uh, the head. That's usually the best identifying trait. Another good example of a prawn. Uh, and 
again, this is kind of one of those weird times where same prawn versus shrimp conjures up an image in our head. It has nothing to do with science, obviously. Here would be your shrimp. Um, let's draw the quotes on here. This is a not a true shrimp. Uh, it's an imposter. Does look very similar to a prawn, but again, if we take our general rule of thumb, you can see that overhanging shield uh, above the eyes and sometimes over the antennae. So we know that this is a dendrobrank shrimp uh, versus a, what we would consider a true shrimp. Here we've got, uh, again, like, I apologize, but I did not set this system up. Um, we've got the dendrobrachiata, which is just prawns, and now we're on to pliosiomata, which includes crabs, lobsters, crayfish, true, true shrimp, lobsters, slipper lobsters, uh, and all their ilk, all their friends come to the party. Um, spiny lobsters are included in there. It's it, it's a very weird way to separate out, hey, here's just prawns, and then there's six billion creatures uh, in this other category. But that's the way it is. Um, here we've got, as opposed to those, again, spirit fingers, uh, filamentous gills. Here we've got unbranched leaf plates. Um, picture looking right about here. The gills are on the underside, but if you picture these almost, uh, plates would be a good example, imagery, uh, scales. Uh, we've got hard palates almost uh, serving as the gills, as opposed to these wavy, tender-like uh, they're, they're a little more locomotory, um, certainly more dexterous appendages. So here we've got unbranched. We don't have spirit fingers anymore. Now your hands are locked together. Uh, we've got plates or scales uh, operating as the gills. The other thing they're going to do differently, uh, as we just heard, uh, we, we talked about the, the broadcast spawning aspect. In this case, we're going to brood the eggs on the abdominal appendages, and that'll hopefully reference you back to the anatomy we've talked about so far. But what are some trade-offs here now, uh, both with, I guess, the quiz of what are the abdominal appendages called, uh, and what's the the, the trade-off here? There's always uh, advantage and disadvantage uh, to brooding your eggs internally versus broadcast spawning. Um, so with the abdominal appendages, the pleopods, um, an advantage is going to be like she's going to control what's going on. Um, so rather than just, I guess, kind of like sending caution to the wind and just, you know, spawning everything out to sea and hoping for the best, she's actually going to know what's going on with her eggs at the same time. Now, if mom gets eaten, so do every egg and all of her offspring. Um, broadcast spawning also is going to give a lot more like genetic diversity. Um, than her brooding eggs um, on the pleopods as well. Yeah, genetic diversity is a very important part to discuss. Um, typically, if an animal's, this isn't internal fertilization, but it's, it's much closer to that. Uh, if an animal's gonna brood their eggs, they usually had one partner. Uh, with broadcast spawning, as we just heard, uh, you do have the increase of genetic diversity simply because think about it, a female could release hundreds of thousands of eggs and you could have, again, like air quotes, multiple partners, multiple males fertilizing that clutch. And again, if we go two sections back, yes, most of them are gonna be scooped up very quickly. Uh, whales, manta rays swim by, things like that. Uh, but there, there's always uh, distinct trade-offs between and I don't want to say internal fertilization here, uh, but it, it's much closer than that broadcast spawning method. Uh, it is very analogous to if you guys have taken mammals or anything like that, uh, R and K selected species uh, where we have fewer offspring, but better survivability or a million offspring uh, that are going to primarily wind up as part of the food chain. Uh, it's kind of like rabbits versus elephants or tigers, lions, whatever you want to call it. Uh, rabbits produce tons of offspring. Most of them get eaten. And at the end, we have a same balance versus an elephant 
uh, that maybe has one offspring every couple of years, uh, but that youngster uh, is allowed to survive into adulthood um, because of the investment there. So definite trade-offs. Uh, and I think we heard some good content uh, regarding the advantages or disadvantages of both. So another example of Playa Um I have a few of these images up here just because uh, while we as zoo people get that that's a lobster, a lot of people would be like, what is that? Where is its claws? Uh, did it happened by Joe's Crab Shack and somebody stole them? No, this is a spiny lobster. Um, here we have the crab body form, which we're going to discuss ad nauseum. Uh, the crab body form, I think, is arguably one of the most fascinating things in nature. Uh, lots of crazy stuff going on there. Lobsters, again, probably not everyone's iconic idea of a lobster, uh, but lobsters nonetheless. We've got our crayfish. Crayfish are another funny one. Uh, depending on where you grew up, uh, you probably have a million names for the for these guys. Uh, crawdads, uh, mud bugs, mud lobsters. I've heard a lot. Uh, again, though, very weird identification of these animals because so often uh, we're talking about what it looks like on a plate or in a pot with some corn and potatoes um, versus the actual science of what's uh, really making up these animals. This is our true shrimp. Uh, again, this is the reason that the air quotes were around the dendrobrate version. Um, our, our true shrimp. Tons of species here. Uh, again, no blanket rules, but typically your true shrimp are gonna be operating in much more of a uh, symbiotic relationship type environment uh, for the most part. Here we have, and there's, I'll, I'll just be upfront with you. A couple of gratuitous pictures, uh, just because I think slipper lobsters are some of the coolest things out there. I do want you right now to take note real quick about uh, what we're seeing right there. They lack those big uh, <clears throat> first pair of the locomotory appendages that have turned into Kelle. Uh, they do have modifications, though, to still make them very efficient in the ecosystem. But slipper lobster, another slipper lobster. And this has nothing to do with anything. They're just awesome. I felt like they deserved a couple pictures. Uh, if you've ever had a chance uh, to get up to a place like the Butterfly Pavilion, uh, they have slipper lobsters on display there. They are just so cool to watch, uh, very cool to work with. Just, again, this is just for me. Uh, they're just awesome animals, uh, and I felt like they needed more than one picture. So uh, we've got as far as like coverage here, again, five pairs of periopods. Uh, the carapace, which you might be thinking more like a turtle shell. Uh, when we have a combination uh, of uh, uh, uniting uh, of two body parts, we usually combine that word too. And in this case, the carapace is going to cover both the midsection and the head. Uh, and so from that, of course, we get the term cephalothorax. Uh, it becomes one unit because of how it is armored or covered. So in your, let's just take a typical insect, for example, we have a very distinct head, we have a thorax, and then we have an abdomen. One of the important things here, and we, I know I hammer on this all the time, when in between chalicerates and these guys, uh, for the most part, almost across the board, if you have locomotory appendages, they're always gonna be attached to the thorax. The abdomen usually contains either no limbs uh, or internal organs, uh, the digestive tract, things like that. The thorax is always where the connection happens for locomotory appendages. Uh, and here, yes, technically this, I'll even move this over a little bit. Yes, this is the head, uh, this is the thorax. But because we have this carapace that covers all of it as one solid cohesive unit, sorry, I'll get all that off your screen. Um, it, it combines both the, the body parts and the name. So now we've got cephalothorax versus just head, thorax, abdomen. Uh, as far as um, 
the other characteristics that go into these animals, uh, we know that they breathe with that iconic, uh, rather their plate or filamentous gills. Um, we of course have way too many species here to just say that they all breathe with gills. Uh, they've basically evolved into the form where they can have what we call, uh, some people call them book lungs, things like that. Uh, we have animals that have developed the ability to come onto land and then use essentially fully functional lungs. Uh, obviously very relevant. Uh, it's gonna come into play quite a bit uh, with how some of these species operate. Again, you got to picture animals that are in a more than likely intertidal zone. Uh, so animals that have to deal with water influx uh, and then the absence of water at times uh, provides a lot of challenges. Uh, and we'll talk about a lot of that later. As far as uh, some other adaptations that these animals have developed, and again, guys, this is just general anatomy. Like, there's tons of species, obviously, that don't possess this setup, uh, but many do, so it's important to note. Uh, we've got two pairs of antennae. Uh, all crustaceans will. They do change and manifest themselves in different way, but we've got a pretty important thing to observe here. Our first pair uh, is going, and again, first being, let me get the pencil out. First being uh, closest to the midsection or the mid region of the animal. Um, second, it, it picture like moving out and away from the body. So your first one's closest, uh, and the the second pair is just further away from the midline or the the bisection of the animal. Um, our first one's going to be used for smell. Uh, they are going to be smaller, but that's for a reason. The second pair is usually very elongate. Uh, and this will have a tactile response. So picture uh, a cat's whiskers uh, where we've got this extra sensory organ being useful moving forward, probably in a dark environment. Uh, we've got the tactile part and the chemosensory part. But why is it important that we have both and both in different setups? So the benefit of having two two separate pairs of antennae and their different functions is that if they were to lose one or all of them in a fight like so instead of saying all right off the bat let's use an example um of losing uh one of each pair right so they each serve kind of a different purpose but if they were in um a fight over a mate or a predator issue, like being threatened and lost something from a predator, um, they're able to utilize the other two in this scenario to compensate for the ones lost. They can still use them to feel around for chemo reception or other modified, um, other modified uh, structures of or what they're used for, um, but also just until they grow back. So again, if they did lose all four uh, individual antennae, they're able to grow them back, but they'll be more cautious through their environment, um, maybe hide a little bit longer or in a more heavily populated by their own species area. Um, again, they do grow these back, but they also are used as defense as sensory so even though they have their own different kind of um uses uh per pair they, they do compensate each other in a nutshell is what i'm trying to say yeah exactly uh the the compensation aspect important um they would be at a significant disadvantage uh where they'd have basically let's say just one pair of both tactile and chemosensory uh organs out there, uh, body parts. If, again, and I think it was brought up, every possibility that could happen, uh, mates, predation, competition, all that, um, you'd be at an immediate disadvantage where you lose even one. Uh, the fact that you have four and four in total, two pairs, uh, each serving their own purpose and own function, uh, makes it really advantageous for these animals 
because uh, they never lose all of it, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, they're, they're never going to lose. Uh, maybe they'll lose, let's say, one antennae out here. Uh, so yeah, you can't feel around as much, uh, but you've got these chemosensory organs here. Uh, they're taking up chemical cues from the water. Uh, you're not flying blind, so to speak. Uh, lots of advantages uh, to what two individual pairs, each operating separately, uh, offer to these animals. Uh, as far as the other appendages on the front of the animal, uh, we do have, obviously, the we have to talk about the elephant in the room, uh, this first pair of modified uh, claws or appendages. Um, they're going to be kind of just like uh, stomatopoda had the raptorial appendage. This is basically the, the bread and butter uh, for your decapod species. It's how we have modifications to the body. That's going to serve functions for both meat, uh, feeding, mating, uh, defense, competition, mate attraction. Uh, a lot goes in to the development uh, of these appendages. So uh, as far as, let's start with the defense side. Uh, with the decapod body plan, again, we have such a huge, broad aspect to cover here. Um, we just, we got to talk about just general uh, specific, like general ideas of how these animals operate. Uh, again, with the intent in the back of our mind that none of this is set in stone. There's no blanket statements. Way too many species here to say one thing and just call it good. With the defenses that these animals have built in, if they have a telson, um, meaning the extension of the body, basically, again, telson usually goes along with an abdomen. Um, if they have a uh, shrimp or lobster type form, uh, where you have, again, that tail. And the reason I'm pointing this out is obviously very different from a crab body form, right? Um, if you have that telson present, it's going to be used for uh, predator avoidance for the most part if you're heavy enough. Uh, the, uh, I guess the, the way that the telson is going to be used differs depending on the size of the animal. Let's go back. I'm not going to flip through this, all the slides, uh, but if we go back to the pictures of the shrimp or the prawns, you have that telson. It's got tons of swimmerettes on it. You're going to use that to swim forward. As you get heavier, uh, let's say your big uh, deep sea lobster, now that uh, telson is going to be used for predator avoidance in the other direction. Uh, the way this works, picture at home, uh, have your hand flat and then curve it into a C very quickly. Uh, Hopefully that makes sense. You're going to snap the telson down, uh, again, almost in a C shape, and that will shunt you backwards. Uh, that's how, you, let's say, again, as we were just talking about with the tactile response, let's say you're cruising along, you don't have the best eyesight, uh, but one of your antennae uh, touches something threatening, uh, you very quickly snap your body into a C. Uh, picture like... And I don't know how many of you have ever, hopefully you've been exposed to this because it's wonderful. They're some of the most fun things out there. Uh, you guys know those uh, wristbands you can straighten out and then everybody slaps them on the wrist and they curve around. Uh, picture like that. Uh, you've got a very quick snapping uh, to move the animal backwards. And then if you're not heavily bodied, uh, your abdomen or your telson is going to have swimmerettes. And that's how you use to swim cutely around uh, and become, again, plankton or krill uh, in that case. Crabs, uh, their abdominal appendage, I'm not going to say it doesn't serve a purpose. Uh, it absolutely does. It houses, uh, most importantly, the reproductive tract. Uh, but it obviously, and again, crab uh, used as a term where it probably conjures up what a crab looks like. But we're going to talk about the difference between crabs and true crabs and things like that. Uh, but the abdomen is basically being folded in uh, and serves no purpose as far as locomotion. With the disparity here, and again, this is, I, I almost feel overwhelmed myself trying to tackle uh, this large of a group in one lecture. Uh, we've got 
such diversity and size and shape and modifications, uh, adaptations. Uh, pea crabs, Japanese spider crabs make great examples. Pea crabs make their living inside of other uh, shellfish. They're very tiny, uh, almost live a parasitic lifestyle. Japanese spider crabs, let me just tell you guys, if you haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to one of these, like put it on your bucket list. Uh, they're, they're insane. Uh, I, can't, I can't put into words uh, the kind of awe uh, they almost inspire. Uh, it's like seeing like a crawling Volkswagen. Uh, they're very cold water species. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I know I've seen them uh, in Oregon uh, at the aquarium up there. I, I know they're housed other places. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but man, it is, it's a very cool experience to see these things. They don't look real. Like it, it, they seem like something that shouldn't work. Uh, they're so big and also gangly at the same time. Uh, the way they move is, I think, and I know my wife would say this too, they horrify her the way they move. They move like uh, the girl from the ring crawling out of the TV. It's a very like sporadic strobe light movement, um, but super cool animals. Uh, definitely put them on your bucket list. So this is arguably one of the weirdest parts we have to discuss about uh, decapods in general. If this image wasn't on your screen and I said shrimp, lobster, and crab, you would probably get these images in your head, uh, but they have absolutely no scientific or taxonomic reasoning behind them. Uh, and that's why we're, we're, we're having this discussion right now. Uh, we have to kind of break ourselves of those bad habits. Uh, we have to get out of that mindset of here's what a crab looks like. Here's what a lobster looks like uh, and go off of basically what they look like on a plate. Uh, that, that doesn't make sense as far as science would go. They do have the advantage uh, of getting us close to kind of the final product, if you will. Um, but again, and I, I know I use this example all the time, uh, it's analogous to calling everything breakfast food. Uh, a chicken, a cow, a pig, all can show up on your plate in some form or another, uh, but we wouldn't just call them breakfast animals uh, and make that association from there. The dendrobranchs are arguably the least modified Again, very numerous here uh, as far as species count uh, and just numbers in general with that broadcast spawning method. Um, but overall, uh, significantly less modified than the rest of the decapods. Uh, they're, they're not going to typically have uh, the kelle or kelepeds. Um, very simplified body form. Like I was saying, uh, this weird association we have with identifying these animals based off how they look on our plate uh, comes through quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's bizarre. There's, there's no way to explain it. And again, I'm, I'm hopefully trying to break you of those bad habits. Um, that right here, for example, I bet a lot of people would say, wow, I got a crab. Uh, this is obviously a lobster. And I don't know, I'd probably split it 50-50 between someone saying, oh, my plate has shrimp on it versus prawns. Um, this is not a crab. Uh, it's, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly, but have to get it off my chest. Just tell you the truth right now. Uh, these, again, shrimp or prawn, it's almost a, a, a lingo uh, that we've come up with uh, to identify them. And again, uh, usually geography plays a part in that. Uh, same thing with uh, crayfish versus crawdads. Uh, depending on where you grew up, how, how you grew up, uh, you might call them different things. But understand, none of this has anything to do with taxonomy and science and zoology, uh, which is what we're here to actually get done. Um, so try, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to yell at you if you go to like Joe's Crab Shack and order um, like a king crab. Uh, just in the back of your mind, understand the taxonomy and science, which is what everyone likes to do at dinner time, uh, of these animals, and realize it has no ramifications or impact on the, the the true science of how we organize these animals. With slipper and spiny lobsters, 
you're not going to see them pop up on a plate too much. Uh, I, I know I, I've read in Asia, uh, spiny lobsters are very desirable. They do have a kind of a fatter, meatier telson. Um, I got to assume uh, America's opposed to them because they don't have that iconic lobster claw. Uh, if you just had an animal that all you had was the tail, um, who knows? Uh, but for whatever reason, they don't show up too often around here on a plate, uh, but are consumed. They're not going to have this modified set of appendages, the big, meaty, uh, again, kind of iconic uh, lobster claw that everybody wants to see on their plate. Um, Gordon Ramsay, for example, would not uh, get down with a spiny lobster. Uh, the spiny and slipper lobsters both, though, have one... I guess two, if we include the lack of claws, uh, very unique trait. Uh, they have a very unusual larval form. This is known as a phylosoma. The reason it's so unique, uh, and I know we've heard from everybody today, uh, all these broadcast spawning occasions. Typically when all these broadcast spawners perform that, uh, the offspring that are lackadaisically floating around the ocean uh, look like what they're going to become. Does that make sense? Um, they look like that form of direct development. Uh, if you're a shrimp and you broadcast spawn, you're going to look like a little shrimp swimming around. The thylosoma looks alien-like, uh, is the only way to describe it. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I'm bringing this up uh, is it becomes super important with the marine biology side of everything. Uh, very important to note uh, what these animals are, and it took scientists and zoology a long time to catch up with what the heck we were looking at. Uh, this does not look like a spiny lobster. Uh, a typical lobster larvae looks like a baby lobster. Uh, here we have uh, something that confused people for a long time when you're going out and taking samples and under a microscope examining everything. You look at one of these and you're like, Whoa, okay. We got something alien here. Uh, these things were dropped from outer space. What's this ever going to turn into? Uh, and so the phylosoma was a big emphasis as far as the study of decapods and crustaceans in general. All right, on to some of my favorite animals out there, the crabs. Uh, crabs obviously compact if we look here. Again, picture a lobster. We're going to have that cool, fancy, fanned tail. Uh, that's obviously missing now. Uh, we do not have uh, the telson anymore. The abdomen itself is modified to fold back in on the animal. Uh, but the way that abdomen folds is extremely important. Uh, in true crabs, uh, the brachyurans, we have an abdomen that's been folded uh, almost in on itself, and we can see this from the underside of the animal pretty easily. Difficult to tell from the top, obviously. Uh, it looks like one big piece. But <clears throat> the abdomen in brachyurans has been folded, reduced in size, uh, and is only going to be involved in reproduction. This, <laughs> I'm just, every time I do this lecture, I always think the same thing. Like, it's incredible uh, how efficient crabs are. Uh, and I don't think they get their proper uh, praise for that. Uh, they make up about half of the decapods in general. So you think about all your shrimp, like put that into perspective in, in the back of your mind right now. Think about all the um, shrimp, lobsters, uh, crayfish, mud bugs, prawns, uh, you name it. Crabs make up about half of this group. That, that's insane. Those numbers are staggering. Uh, which kind of sheds some light on what we're going to talk about next, uh, but it it should be very, uh, I don't know, humbling uh, to be like, wow, the, the, the simple crab makes up half of this giant group of dec decapods. They've got to be doing something right. And that brings us to anomurins. Anomurins, part of the crab form, uh, make up a ton of species here too, but they're in disguise, if you will. They're, they're catfishing. Um, 
I think that's the buzzword for it now. Uh, they're not real crabs. Uh, we have what I think is, and again, this is my personal bias coming through. You don't have to say this at a job interview, uh, but I think one of the craziest, strangest phenoms uh, that occurs in nature, we have what's called carcinization. Uh, and put simply, uh, crabs work. They make it work. Uh, what is it, Tim Gunn that says that? Make it work, designers. And that's what nature did uh, with the crab form. Uh, carcinization becomes, again, kind of a phenomena that we can't really explain. We just know it works. It's like gravity. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to discuss, but we know it's there. We know it's happening uh, all around us. Uh, and carcinization is that for the animal kingdom. Hermit crabs and king crabs, uh, porcelain crabs, a lot of people aren't familiar with. Uh, but again, king crab is arguably one of the most popular food items out there. You're not eating a crab. You're eating an imposter crab. Uh, you're eating an anomurin. Um, and... I totally understand there's not a lot of restaurants that are going to uh, advertise that. Uh, you don't go to Joe's Crab Shack and it says free anomurins tomorrow um, or it's anomurin week here. Uh, but you go in and you order a king crab. You are not eating a crab. Uh, the idea behind carcinization, and this is one of my favorite quotes ever, uh, one of the many attempts of nature to evolve a crab. It's the process where a crustacean evolves into a crab-like form from a non-crab-like form. And what that means is you've got an offspring uh, that goes through basically an indirect development. Uh, so in the, the larval stages, shouldn't turn out to be a crab, uh, but through evolutionary history, like the default form is a crab. Uh, and again, we, we don't have great explanations for it. We just know it's there. Um, I think it's safe to say, and I know this is like a big reach, uh, but you could argue that the crab is maybe the most efficient animal in nature simply because it keeps happening. Uh, picture all the ideas and imagery you have in your mind of how evolution works. Sometimes it seems like you're just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Crab stuck, uh, and they stuck real well. Uh, the the crab-like form is arguably the most successful thing nature's ever done, which is saying a lot since we're all sitting here uh, learning on computers. Uh, the crab is the best. Like, you can't top it. Uh, otherwise, why would nature mimic it for millions of years and have half of this giant group of decapods uh, wind up looking like crabs? Um, and yes, there's a, a smaller group that is what we consider true crabs, uh, but this is where carcinization comes in, and it's other animals mimicking uh, this extremely efficient model. Uh, and, yeah, I don't know. Part of this is just my bias. I think it's super cool and super fascinating, uh, but very interesting nonetheless. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, with carcinization, would you use the example of... Um, the body, the body structure of a hermit crab. Um, in this scenario, if it were to evolve and not need shells anymore to protect its soft abdomen and its abdomen kind of um, compressed into its central body mass and hardened, would you call that carcinization? Or are you referring to um, just strictly other animals, uh, almost like how a, a octopus and cuttlefish can mimic other animals um but say for example for this example's sake uh if they were to completely just take on that body structure and and then magically have you know uh those body structures rather than just mimicking does that make sense at all yeah 100 percent. it's an awesome question uh yeah really really good uh the idea that uh and let's go to the next slide while we're talking about, actually, I'm gonna leave it here because I like this quote, I like looking at it. Um, the hermit crab question of them having to uh, gain a new shell uh, shows some of the flaws that happen along the way. Uh, it's certainly like, 
hey, I'm not quite a crab, but I really want to be. Uh, I know that's anthropomorphizing and not what we should do. Um, but the, I don't want to say it's mimicry, uh, like Ceph's and uh, like Mimic Octopus, for example. It's not mimicry, uh, but it's nature trying to do that. It's, it's like forcing uh, mimicry to happen. Uh, the interesting point that was brought up, and I'm so glad uh, it was introduced, was the fact that the hermit crab does have to get a shell uh, because that abdomen's a little different. Um, the best way we know how to discern a crab from a true crab is usually the abdomen. Brachyurines have a perfectly symmetrical, meaning like butterfly wings, folded up abdomen. Um, and we're not going to see that here, but they're trying. It's like you're trying your best. Uh, we have an asymmetrical folding here of the abdomen itself. Uh, you can see right here on the bottom right of your screen, a typical brachyurine would have all of this stuff combined right here. Uh, it'd be a perfect folding underneath. Uh, and again, guys, like I'm not expecting you to go to your local restaurants and then flip your crab over and say, hey, you serve me anomurin. Uh, but it's true. And uh, like the question that was just brought up, it's a slightly, and I'm saying slightly very, very lightly because I don't want to insult these animals, uh, a slightly off version. And they're always kind of chasing that dream of being a crab. Uh, they're not mimicking it. Uh, it's just, it's, it's worked. Uh, and I know that's not science wise, probably the best way to explain it, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, that's what carcinization is. It's nature's been doing what she do for a long time and crabs work. Uh, so, uh, everybody's trying to be them. Uh, and I, I know it's a weird analogy, but like your crabs are your Tom Brady's of the animal world. Every little crab growing up uh, is going to try to mimic that this design and this model because it works um, it, it's it's been proven i mean we have millions of years of evolutionary history to put a stamp on there that says crab approved uh, and they're still successful today uh, captivity wise uh, we still keep them quite a bit uh, in varied forms uh, one of the i think overlooked aspects of keeping crabs in general uh, comes in the form of the humble uh, should I say humble yeah they're humble um, but the hermit crab I think doesn't get its fair due they're very cool animals has anybody ever kept them or have anything cool husbandry wise uh, as far as keeping hermit crabs so please allow me to date myself here but it's okay I do it all the time <laughs> Tell me, like, as a kid in the 90s, you know, like, walking through the mall with your mom and your dad, there were those stands that had hermit crabs. And I remember being a kid and them having, like, the painted shells and thinking, like, that is the coolest thing. I need one. And looking back at it, like, they were in those little tiny, cr like, uh, critter keepers with literally, like, just painted shells and, you know, like, store-bought kibble, basically. And just, like, this terrible husbandry. So a couple years ago, just like looking at like reptiles and like um, looking for local, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Rescue groups. I found a hermit crab rescue group and ended up like getting, looking into like their husbandry and if I wanted to keep them um, and just seeing like what they actually needed. And I ended up getting a couple and like, I ended up putting them, they need at least 10 gallons, um, go big or go home. So I had a 20 gallon tank laying around, put them in a 20 gallon tank. Um, they need salt, but not aquarium salt. So you actually have to go find like ocean salt for them. They need to be able to submerge in their water. Um, I remember as a kid, like the little critter keepers just had sand in them, but they like, they need sand, but they have to maintain a decent amount of uh like humidity so i had to mix a little bit of cocoa fiber in with them like we have come a long way from just throwing them in these little critter keepers um i had like uh, about eight inches of substrate in there made sure that they were able to bury themselves had to put uh gradient heat on the tank as well um keep them out of sunlight they didn't really need like a heat light or anything like that um and then feeding them like i thought you know oh you just go buy hermit crab food 
but they can live basically off of the grocery store, like regular proteins, uh, veggies like they need a lot of bright veggies because if they're like carotene deficient they'll just turn gray and really look sad like it's a lot to actually take care of them but it's really rewarding and they're super awesome and it's really fun to just like throw like an extra bag of carrots and like a couple pieces of you know meat in your cart and be like oh there's my hermit crab food for the week man there's so much to to break down i i couldn't have gotten a better answer like I think we have to address first off, though, that again, I, I'll, I'll do it so that no one in the room feels awkward. Yeah, there was nothing cool than walking around the mall and seeing those hermit crabs. Like, I think that's probably tied for things I wanted as a kid uh, with like a power wheels. Uh, that was, I think, the coolest thing out there. Uh, they had those stupid, uh, and who knows what awful like nail polish they put on those poor things. Uh, but man, I was like, oh man, if I could have a hermit crab. I'm a real zookeeper. Like that, that's my jam. Right. Uh, very iconic imagery of that kind of terrible husbandry. Um, actually just flat out, not very good. Uh, but other great points were brought up as well. Uh, the fact that they can eat uh, from the grocery store, uh, like was said, uh, the canned fish foods also a pretty good source, uh, but they need a very diet. Like they do need fresh veggies. Uh, they're very analogous to me personally, uh, to uh, suckerfish or pocostomus. I can't tell you how many former students, uh, friends, family, who knows, like how many people think plecos just eat fish waste. Like, no, they, they need their own diet. Uh, nothing swims around and eats poop for fun. Uh, they go crazy for zucchini, that's a huge one, uh, seaweed, uh, a lot of the green veggies and leafed veggies. Hermit crabs kind of had that wrap for a long time. I hope that's changed now. I haven't uh, checked up on the current hermit crab husbandry standards of the world, but you guys all should make sure they're doing well. Uh, check in on your friend, your your anomurin friend. Um, and hermit crabs, again, kind of become what I think maybe it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about inverts and reptiles and amphibians, they're such kind of like unsung heroes. They have all these cool adaptations, but kind of get taken for granted when it comes to husbandry. Uh, they become accessory animals uh, and hermit crabs definitely aren't. Uh, one of the cool things now, and again, I, we don't have hermit crabs in the classroom currently, um, but if we ever do, uh, one of the cool things is uh, getting the, they have glass shells now. Uh, and I kind of want that uh, just to see that and be able to exhibit um, the asymmetrical folding of the abdomen, which I know is like the dorkiest reason to get a hermit crab. But uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're really cool. Uh, one of the things that was brought up too uh, was the fact that much like cephalopods, which we just discussed, uh, hermit crabs seem so lackadaisical uh, they're insane escape artists as well uh, and that should probably be pointed out there there's a lot more that goes into it and like i said i, I think that's my job here uh, with all of these lectures is to kind of shout out these heroes alex may i share a fun fact absolutely um hermit crabs are if not only then one of the very limited species that are able to um finagle an anemone to let go of a surface because of their use of the anemones um, through symbiotic relationships to kind of help keep them camouflaged, um, maybe even like bring in some food sources. But yeah, I thought I saw that and I thought that that was really cool. I saw it in a video on YouTube, but I thought it was so cool because they're, I, I watched this hermit crab change shells and then start pulling on these um anemones and the narrator was like yeah they're the only ones that can actually get an anemone to let go and i'm thinking at first because i saw it like middle of the video i look up and i'm thinking is it trying to like eat it what's it doing i'm like oh no i remember because we've talked about it you know they use them as that you know kind of like quote unquote decoration um but yeah i just wanted to add that in i thought it was so cool yeah uh 
the idea in decorator crabs are probably the most famous. That's what everybody goes to. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a ton of these species that are so oddly, uh, and again, symbiotic being a positive thing now, uh, in tune with the world around them, um, being able to manipulate an anemone to let go. And it's, it's true manipulation. Like it's not just grabbing something and ripping it off. They'll sit there and they almost, I don't know, I guess it sounds probably kind of creepy, but almost massage the anemone uh, until it releases its, its grasp uh, planted on the new shell. And all animals seem to win from the relationship for the most part. Uh, anemones get uh, the messy food as they're eating. Uh, they get a free ride. The crab gets protection because nothing wants to go down and get stung by an anemone. Uh, but yeah, I'm so glad we heard uh, both of these uh, kind of stories because uh, it does echo how kind of, again, unsung heroes uh, these animals are. Super cool, super fascinating. Uh, the very humble fake imposter crab uh, along with all of the crabs. Like, there's a lot more to it, guys, than just like, oh, cool, I'll throw some nail polish on the shell and call it call it a day. Uh, a lot more to it. Uh, so please, if you're at a facility uh, that kind of has these accessory animals, make sure you put in the, the time and care that you would, like, the same thing you would for, like, an elephant. Um, obviously not as much food, but hermit crabs eat a lot. Uh, you'd be surprised. Um, but, yeah, so don't put it on elephant diet necessarily. Uh, but the, the husbandry and the care needs to be there, even if they're just jewel box, accessory, uh, side piece animals. As far as uh, some other things we're going to see with decapods in general, uh, a lot more, and, and again, this is all developing as we move forward in the world of zookeeping. Uh, the idea of behavior, how we can train, uh, enrichment, rewards, things like that. Uh, for a long time, they're just stuff that we fish. Uh, we go out and throw a net out and get these animals, eat them, call it a day. Uh, now that we're keeping them in captivity more, we're seeing a lot of unique behaviors. Uh, the Caribbean spiny lobster, uh, most notably, uh, has some really unique behaviors. We do have some, uh, in king crabs, we have the uh, ability to basically aggregate, which is what we call when a bunch of organisms really kind of pile in on one another. Uh, and with king crabs, it's very unique because uh, they will essentially uh, pile in on one another and look like a bigger organism. Uh, they'll do it for predator avoidance, which is crazy. I, people didn't think that was possible years ago. Uh, it's kind of like uh, if you pictured the movie Finding Nemo, uh, where all the fish school together and create what looks like a bigger fish. That's what red king crabs will do. And red king crabs on their own aren't like, they're not tiny, they're not trivial little species. You get a bunch of giant pinchers all piled in on one another. Uh, very few animals are gonna mess with that. Uh, the thing I wanna focus on here, and this video will be linked to you uh, aside from the lecture, is the behavior exhibited uh, by spiny lobsters. Uh, has anybody seen this or can weigh in on what happens in this video? Oh, yeah, this video is a fun one. Um, so what's happening in the video is basically you have lines or rows of lobsters kind of. It looks like they're uh, they have kind of like a chain gang kind of thing going on where they're latched to each other and they have their antenna. Um, tilt it out into the into the current rather than and kind of feeling around rather than like straightforward or feeling their mates or their you know their buddies for all intents and purposes um but uh so what they're doing is they're traveling across an open area to a more protected location um and because this area is leaving them super open and vulnerable for predators um they're linked together in a line um, and even so, you'll see where different uh, groups are are combining together. Um, so yeah, because of the vulnerability, they utilize banding into lines and clusters as danger nears and extend their antenna to detect predators, but also to um, 
give the impression that they're sharp and dangerous because they have these spines coming out of their faces. Um, so a huge advantage of doing doing so is, you know, you're, you have protection for a group, um, but with a kind of group protection, you're always going to have that um, straggler or the sacrifice of one or few. Um, at the end of the video, you see where that kind of happens and there's a trigger fish and a couple other fish kind of just having a meal out of this one lobster that didn't quite make it um, in the group. But yeah, uh, and then you'll see where the rest kind of disperse after they've made their destination and they no longer are banding together and staying together, um, but rather than finding their own little habitats to inhabit. Yeah, excellent. And, and man, um, I, I like the analogy of the, the straggler. Uh, that is kind of, I guess, I mean, you guys know mother nature is not kind in any way whatsoever. Uh, there is always that last kid in gym class um, and they do, they typically put them at the back of the line. You do have the advantage of powers in number, uh, but there's a reason they have kind of a pecking order of who's marching first, uh, who's leading the parade uh, versus somebody in the back. And yes, uh, the, the trigger fish, does swoop in at the end of the video just for some gratuitous violence uh, and does pick off individuals but as a whole uh, them moving in that fashion i'm so glad the antennas were brought up because it does it makes them look like uh, like a briar patch i guess uh, like a giant set of barbed wire running through the water uh, it becomes much more intimidating does it always work not for the last ones in line um, but yeah, there's a lot more complexion that goes into it. If I can elaborate a little bit more on that behavior, I thought that that was like super cool. Um, the trigger fish was quote unquote disarming uh, by taking chunks out of the lobster's antenna. And, um, you know, the narrator says, you know, as as is being disarmed. And I thought that that was kind of cool because those are, they are extended to look like giant swords you know but if if a trigger fish approached a, a group like that like the marching group you know he would have to keep track of the one he's disarming but then he'd have to disarm the whole group in that cluster uh, well not the whole group but yeah just specified in that cluster that in that area that he's um uh infiltrating and then and the reason he's doing that is so that he can then go for the legs and how are you gonna you know just spend all that energy disarming quote unquote a group a, sp a specified area of this group and then start going for legs when their entire carapace um they're all together and their legs are more underneath the the concentrated um carapace cluster does that make sense yeah 100 percent. I'm, I'm glad you used the word disarming i think that's cool uh what was just mentioned uh the idea that a perfectly capable trigger fish that could very easily take out a spiny lobster has to first disarm them and, and that is what happens uh the uh, fish starts chewing or knocking off pieces of those large antennules that are or antennae that are out um the fact that and again i'm not trying to anthropomorphize but the idea that a fish that could very easily tackle one of these things uh, knows it has to start dismantling uh, the organism in the in the group before it gets in there uh, just shows how efficient uh, that model of marching and uh, forming a, a phalanx really is. Uh, if you guys have ever seen like the movie Gladiator, uh, which I'm only bringing this up because I watched it recently with my uh, wife, like there's a scene in there where all the soldiers are going to try to fight on their own and they all have their own shields. Uh, but they all work together all of a sudden and come together as a basically a giant group of shields. Uh, and that works out for them, uh, not for Joaquin Phoenix, but that's a story for another day. But yeah, same idea. Like there really is a, a power in numbers there. Uh, typically a trigger fish could take out a spiny lobster at ease at will. Um, but you do, you have, uh, I think it was said like a giant link of carapace, not just a lobster. Uh, you have, an entire mob to go through uh, and 
yeah, I, I, I guess um, I don't really have much to add to it. But yeah, the fact that you got to picture this one organism and a fish is having to strategize and use tactics to try to break this chain up uh, really does speak to how efficient and smart it is uh, and what advanced behavior these animals that have no real communicative ability uh, they're not calling each other and saying hey let's migrate now uh, but then figure out hey it's this time of the season let's all form in a single line we're one giant string of armor uh, with spikes pr projecting out everywhere uh, really does speak for uh, the underrated behavior these animals exhibit as far as uh, the other ways these animals communicate one of the um, odd or most uncommon thing that people don't think about very often is how terrestrial species uh, are going to communicate communication underwater uh, takes away a lot of the uh, auditory part uh, obviously uh, it's much more uh, chemosensory performed usually by pheromones uh, ammonia based compounds things like that but animals that are terrestrial still have a way just like this behavior we were talking about to get a hold of one another and talk uh, the method in which this is done is unique uh, not just to decapoda but extends way into especially hexapoda uh, for the most part, but what else communicates with the stridulating surface? If you've ever lost a cricket out of your cricket keeper, uh, crickets do, of yep. course, like two o'clock in the morning when they're trying to find where they are escaped in your house. Um, but actually like fire ants, beetles, um, a lot of kind of like the bugs are going to communicate through that stridulation as well. Yeah, and so I'm so glad that was brought up. Just FYI, don't feel bad if any of you have ever kept crickets for feed, use, whatever, uh, you've lost one and you've heard it. Uh, that ability to communicate using, uh, it, it's basically two hard surfaces running together, rubbing together, uh, you rub your hands together real fast, same idea. Uh, crickets, probably the most notable. Uh, it's weird when you're out in nature for like a stroll with your loved one uh, and you hear that cricket sound, you're like, oh, this is such a magical evening. And then, as was just mentioned, at two in the morning after you were trying to feed, feed your bearded dragon uh, and you hear it, not as romantic, uh, but very interesting that we see the same behavior uh, exhibited in decapod species that are terrestrial because uh, we usually lend that idea uh, to insects in general. The chemosensory part uh, where pheromones are released. I know I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. Anytime we have a surface that is usually either vascularized or exposed to water where we can take in oxygen, um, release waste gases, these animals are really efficient in that regard. Uh, and nothing gets weirder as far as communication than the way that a lot of aquatic crustaceans communicate with one another. The crayfish uh, is a great example. And again, if you call them crawdads, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll call them crawdads every now and then, make you feel more at home. Uh, crayfish, crawdads, mud bugs, mud lobster. I'm trying to think of anything else I've heard. I think that's pretty close. Uh, these animals, I'm going to try to say this as maturely as possible, but there's really no uh, maturity about it. Uh, they, for competition purposes, uh, they literally pee into each other's faces. Uh, that, that's how dominance is established. Uh, whoever has the uh, craziest, like you had asparagus last night type thing, uh, whoever has the most potent urine that's released through the antenal glands. Again, they're not urinating they're releasing waste ammonious products from their bodies but they blow it right into their opponent's face um, hopefully uh, hopefully you never encounter a bar fight like this because uh, it, it does not sound fun or yeah that should never make its way onto the internet uh, the idea of and again for, for the sake of our 
lecture, they're, yes, urinating into each other's faces, but there's so much more that goes into it. Uh, they're releasing ammonia-based pheromones from the antenna, uh, directing it at the opponent. And that's the huge advantage they have. They don't have to uh, actually, quote unquote, go to the bathroom. Uh, they're able to do this as a passive byproduct. And it should also be mentioned that during this crazy, weird urine fight, um, they're also taking on uh, perfectly clean oxygen as well. Uh, that's one of the awesome kind of trade-offs with being able to just instantly release uh, any toxins in the bloodstream of the body. Uh, you're also taking on perfectly clean oxygen. So you're getting a deep breath, you're using an inhaler and subsequently urinating in your opponent's face. It sounds weird, uh, but it's much smarter uh, than it, it comes off. Uh, it, it's much smarter than I could explain it. So it's a it's a good model, uh, and again, something else that should be pointed out too. Using a form of competition like this, uh, really effective, um, <clears throat> mainly because injuries aren't going to be that severe. Uh, you're literally looking at which opponent has the most potent urine, uh, and so while you do have this locking up that you see here on your screen. You have the initial jousting. Uh, you're not going to have dismemberment and death, uh, which we would see in like some somatopod species, for example. Uh, as far as some interesting behavior aspects, uh, we certainly do have them. Again, this is kind of an evolving field. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them, but again, I'm going to shout out Butterfly Pavilion. Uh, they're some of the leaders in the industry on this behavior and enrichment aspect and the, the training of an invertebrate species, uh, which up till recently like was not really thought of. Um, these animals are very capable of learning. Uh, they are very, very food motivated. I'll tell you that much right now. Uh, like that's hands down the best way to get them to train, but you can target, uh, you can get them to perform a few behaviors. Again, food has to be involved for the most part, uh, but they're capable of learning complex stuff. The I think this was even brought up earlier, uh, crabs being able to manipulate uh, anemones. Here's a great example. Again, symbiotic relationships. I know we've harped on this a bunch. Uh, they're not always good. Uh, just because it says symbiotic doesn't mean everybody high fives and gets along. Symbiotic is just two organisms living together. It does not mean it's a, what do they call it now, a toxic relationship. Like, it, it can be positive for both, uh, neutral for some. In the case of parasitic relationships, obviously negative on one end where one benefits. But uh, you could argue that decapods make up a majority of your usually mutualistic, so positive for everyone, symbiotic relationships. Uh, they set up cleaning stations. Uh, and I never remember uh, the movie. There, there's some cartoon movie where the fish run a car wash where they clean off whales and stuff like that. Uh, the I think Will Smith sent it. I have no clue. Uh, that's usually where decapods find their niche in symbiotic relationships. It's usually uh, very positive for both parties. In this case, as you can see at the bottom right, uh, as we talked about earlier, that manipulation and placement of anemones uh, provides benefits for both. Uh, really the only downside is when the crab has to move the anemone onto maybe a new shell or things like that. Uh, but for the most part, your decapods, like if we were all decapods, you'd want another decapod to be your friend. Like they're usually uh, very giving in the relationship uh, and it usually works out well for both parties. Uh, like, yeah, the, the, the idea of symbiotic, again, I, I want to make sure everybody is clear. It's not always positive. With decapods, it usually is more often than not. There's, there's I'm not going to say very few because we're talking about millions of species here. Uh, but there, there's just very few instances where uh, a decapod is at a detriment to another organism. Uh, usually it's at least uh, neutral in the relationship, but very often it, it works out for both parties.
Uh, this video will be linked to you as well. Um, it's it's going to cover a lot of what we just talked about with symbiotic relationships. Uh, honestly, it's probably stuff that you do already know, uh, but always cool to see our, our boy Bird out there doing his thing. Uh, so you'll get that link as well. As far as feeding, oops, feeding ecology, uh, the important part here uh, is the idea of uh, kind of breaking the, the, the mindset that these animals are all just scavengers. Uh, they are definitely not. Um, these animals are capable of suspension feeding, meaning you reach out and you can see that with the filamentous uh, apertures here, uh, capable of plucking food out of the water column, uh, deposit feeding is another one. Uh, deposit feeding we'll talk a lot more about um, when we get to asteroids or sea stars. There's little clues and hints that we can see uh, as we go through. Just looking at some of these animals, you're going to be able to tell maybe a little, but maybe a lot uh, about their husbandry needs. The uh, filter feeding aspect, again, that's where they're creating their own water movement, just like we talked about with sponges, uh, basically moving uh, the water past you and getting organic particulates out of that, uh, grazing, and then of course, predation. Uh, these animals are really effective predators, uh, which I think goes unsaid quite a bit. The efficiency of these animals uh, really does tie in uh, to how their bodies are modified. Um, and we're going to see that manifest itself with the way that the, again, kelle, claws, kelepeds, with the way the claws are formed that's going to tell us a great deal about how these organisms live uh, and how they make their living i guess uh, the claws tell us much more than like oh that looks good on my plate uh, the specialization of the claws themselves uh, really do give us a great insight as to the husbandry of that animal what food items should we be using is this animal going to be a grazer? Should I just drop a piece of zucchini in there versus should I put in some bivalves uh, and allow this monster to go crush everything? The thing that we'll see most often uh, is the asymmetrical. Remember, we talked about asymmetrical just a second ago with brachyurans uh, versus or anomurans versus brachyurans. Uh, we have a difference in development. And again, it goes unnoticed quite a bit. Uh, again, and I'm sorry to trivialize these animals, but a lot of the times we're just seeing them on a plate. Uh, you're not gonna look down at red lobster and be like, wow, look at the asymmetry of these animals' claws. They clearly serve different purposes. Uh, you're just gonna crack them and dip them in butter. Uh, the asymmetrical, uh, formation of these claws is really, really important. It's vital. It tells us a lot. Almost always, I'm not going to say always, but uh, usually we'll have one claw uh, that's used for uh, kind of power and one for speed and dexterity. Uh, so you have one, it, it, it's like being right or left-handed. Uh, you have one arm that you feel like you could do a good punch with, uh, and then your left one you can just use for everyday simple tasks. Uh, kind of the same idea here. Uh, when we have a massive, I don't want to say muscular, heavily armed claw, we'll find these very often. They're called molars, uh, just like the back of your teeth. Uh, they're giant calcium deposits, uh, and that's your power arm. Uh, that's what's going to be used for all the crushing. Uh, and then we'll have typically a more dexterous claw that's more finesse. Uh, so you got one that's there for the, if you picture a boxer, uh, you've got one that's there for the haymaker, the, the power shot, and then one that's there for the little jabs. Uh, this is, for example, this claw is gonna be going up to a bivalve, crushing it open. 
This one's going to delicately pluck the meat out uh, and then transfer it to the mouth. Uh, so we do typically have that asymmetry involved and they both are, uh, they need each other obviously, uh, but it, it's just something important to note when you see that asymmetrical uh, formation, you know this guy's obviously like very well developed. Uh, so you're not always gonna see the molars because uh, again, that takes uh, years of calcium deposition and things like that. Uh, but we know this animal, for example, is left-handed basically, as far as the haymaker. And then it's gonna use that finesse right hand uh, to actually pluck the meat out and, and ingest food. Uh, this is still pretty close uh, to what we talked about with stomatopoda. Um, the asymmetry here, uh, and these are pistol shrimp or snapping shrimp, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, we have, again, another great example of the asymmetry involved. We have one claw that basically, uh, and it's not on the power level that we talked about with uh, mantis shrimp, uh, but they're snapping and stunning, uh, sometimes killing prey outright. But then you need a way to manipulate that food into the mouth. Uh, so beautiful example here of asymmetrical development of the animal uh, in order to be successful uh, with prey acquisition and then prey consumption. Two different things here. Uh, getting that food is one thing. After that, I have to, it's like grilling a steak, but then I need a knife and a fork. Uh, here's your knife and your fork. Here's your grill. The iconic image of the lobster, I guess, is a good place to start here. Um, claws aren't essential. They're not necessary. We have modifications that can occur no matter what. Um, the idea that you need these big monster Hulk hands type thing definitely doesn't hold up. Uh, there's modifications that can occur in other places of the body. And now we're gonna use the mandibles themselves. They're going to be the crushing tools. So, and I apologize if it's small on everyone's screen, but let's look here. One, two, three, four, five. We've got all the locomotory appendages. None of them have been modified to crush. Uh, this is a spiny lobster, uh, the one you'll see in that marching video. We've got 10 locomotory appendages, none of the iconic claws. In this case, the mandibles, the, the uh, maxillopedia, the, the feeding appendages have been modified. It's literally like a, a garbage disposal. Uh, you can walk up to a bivalve, a clam, an oyster, things like that, and literally just start destroying it. Uh, it's, it's very destructive the way these animals operate. Uh, they're vicious hunters, uh, despite the fact that this animal doesn't look menacing to anyone. Um, yeah, they're, they're incredibly efficient animals uh, when it comes to dismantling their prey. They've had a lot of time to develop this. Uh, and so we do have a strict advantage here over some of the lobster species. One, uh, as we talked about earlier with that marching, uh, this is a very intimidating thing to have these huge antennae out. Uh, it, it does put off that appearance like, hey, I'm still dangerous, uh, even though I don't have the ability to quote unquote pinch you. Uh, but think about it from an, a, a nutrient perspective. These animals are also able to not, and I don't wanna say waste, but waste the nutrient devotion to huge claws, all the molars, the calcium deposition. Uh, they've got uh, the same tools uh, they're just not spending as much money on it type thing. Uh, the flip side of this uh, is when we get to terrestrial species. And this is arguably one of the most uh, important niches you can fill out there with our terrestrial, uh, especially crabs uh, for the most part. Some lobsters are able to go in and out um, but this relationship here with uh, the ocean, most importantly, uh, is terrestrial crabs. They fill a unique niche uh, and act as earthworms. There's a big challenge here, though. Why is like why would being an earthworm on the 
on the beach on the side of the ocean. Why is that an important niche and why is it challenging? So to even look at um, the answer to that question, you have to first consider the niche of the earthworm, which is the, the leaf litter and um, organic matters that are left behind from dead animals or like I said, fallen leaves. Um, and what they do is they consume they consume that dead matter and turn basically turn it into um, the soil that we have um, a, a better environment for other species of any living organism to then live in. Um, also aerating, uh, such as the slide indicates. Now, the way that terrestrial crabs can fill this earthworm niche is because is not only because earthworms can't really you know they're not they're not about going in the sand not to anthropomorphize but they're not about going into the sand into these salty areas um they're more of you know soil and and um forest debris or what have you um now going into the beachy sandy or the salty area i meant to say sorry the beachy salty area is where the crabs kind of come in and take on that um that niche that the earthworm is unable to fulfill in this specific uh ecosystem so because terrestrial crabs basically eat the same thing um in a sense you know they're they'll eat meat uh plant matter so uh, there's just basically cleaning that sand um, and as I said before, and the slide indicates, their burrowing kind of, uh, you know, turns the soil or it turns the soil, the sand, and they're able to pull more food and um, organic matter out of there. And they're just picking up the beach if, in, a, in a nutshell. They're picking it up and making it clean for you, but they they eat it. And then as they're digging around for safety or for other food items, um they're providing the same kind of aeration or soil turning and now i'm repeating myself sorry <laughs> no it's it's spot on um and yeah the the uh I, I i i'm willing to jump on the train of anthropomorphizing earthworms saying they don't want to play around with the beach i think that's accurate uh again thinking back to osmosis uh, uh earthworm with that mucosal skin is going to get leached of its uh water supply immediately uh, and desiccate almost on contact. Uh, I forgot to add something too. Um, so because, and I apologize for interrupting, but yeah, because oh, they're oh. unable to fill, fulfill this, uh, this their niche within this specific habitat or ecosystem, if you will, um, that's where, you know, you basically have a huge Thanksgiving dinner buffet of just all of these nutrient rich um areas that are just untouched um i mean you know you see seagulls coming down and trying to pick at the the bigger sources like washed up ocean life etc but um a lots of animals do it on the beach but crabs are specialized for the more kind of microorganism micro um material uh, picking up and like, and that is exactly how they fulfill the earthworm niche because earthworms can't. So that's they step in, and because there's so much that all with the tides, all of this stuff like the plankton, which we talked about, what plankton consists of, plant matter, and a lot of um, organism larvae or or just organisms that are even in adult form. So definitely not wasting food here. Yeah, I'm so glad that was brought up again. I, I probably would have skipped over that. That's like, yeah, that's their niche. That's their role. Imagine not only now, first off, we need an earthworm player here, somebody to just churn the soil. But then imagine, like, if you've ever been to the beach, uh, all the foam fractation bubbles that show up, uh, all the, the, I mean, hopefully your beach isn't polluted because uh, you've cleaned it. But just imagine, like, you've seen all the, the, beaches with all the trash rushing on shore. Now I imagine that's all dissolved organic particulate. Somebody needs to be there uh, churning and moving that through. Somebody's gotta be the recycling center uh, for that, that ecosystem because the earthworms cannot do it. Uh, and yeah, it's not only, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of just repeating what was said earlier. Uh, 
because it was strictly to the point. Um, they're filling the earthworm niche. That's important because it's a difficult environment to live in. There's salt water crashing in and then receding for a while. But we've also got almost a concentration of nutrients occurring. Uh, everything that, again, was meant, I know I'm echoing the sentiments, but the plankton that's flowing in, uh, actual living organisms like large, full-bodied, giant whales that show up. Uh, like, there's a lot to move here. Like, this is like the the equivalent of like the city dump. Uh, we're getting not just a standard issue amount of trash, you're just having constant, uh, almost forceful uh, debris deposition uh, and something's gotta be there to sort through the garbage and let's just use recycling, uh, take out the plastic bottles and separate them into the right bins. Uh, like this is just a concentration of organic particulates being shoved into an environment, which is extremely important, uh, being where the land meets sea, uh, something's got to be there to occupy that niche, uh, and terrestrial crabs were able to do so. As far as uh, reproduction goes, again, for the most part, uh, we've got uh, sexual reproduction, whether it's broadcast spawning or that brooding. Um, and in most cases, uh, it's pretty standard issue. Again, there, there's one where sperm and egg are meeting in the sea, one where the animals are close by uh, and the animal will retain those now fertilized eggs. But why would we ever just give a blanket statement, especially to a group like this? That's where uh, these lovely little crayfish come up or crawdad. Uh, the marmot crabs is a very commonly kept species uh, believe it or not and not like not common petco common common like i'm an aquarist i like this kind of stuff uh, you'll see them pop up quite a bit there uh, and the fascinating part with them and i can say it pretty confidently there's more species that are more than likely to do this uh, this can't be the only one uh, that's like saying there's no like life in outer space type thing like we don't know everything out there there's got to be some unanswered or some other ones that'll raise their hand once we sink the science into it uh, but here we have what's called parthenogenesis it's when a male or a female excuse me is able to without a male produce viable offspring that are essentially fertilized um, they reproduce having never been introduced to a male in their life. You can have full, uh, and what's crazy is, again, from what we know, uh, female will produce a fully fertilized clutch of eggs. They can all reproduce on their own. Uh, you could have one of these uh, organisms and wind up with a uncontrollable colony uh, within very little time. Uh, the turnover rate is pretty quick as far as how they uh, mature. There doesn't, for now, seem to be any impact of this genetic diversity, which I know is a, and I know guys, it, it is important. It is a buzzword. Uh, it's important in conservation and the mammals. With inverts, hey, I've been around about 900 million years longer than you. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I'm still here. Uh, and so that idea of cloning and then possible and again, break yourself out of that mammal mindset, that idea of possible offspring that are siblings mating with one another isn't the same uh, context uh, that we'd look with like inbreeding depression and things that we would see in mammal species. Uh, it's viable, it's been around, uh, and these animals most notably are very, very efficient at it. All right, this is where we get into some crazy stuff here. I'm just going to put it all on the screen for you. We started off slow. We started off with just parthenogenesis earlier with the, the crayfish. Now we're into it. We're in the thick of things. Uh, sexual reproduction with inverts in general is just light years outside of what you're probably all used to with mammalian breeding. Um, let's start at the bottom because that's maybe easier to process right now. There are... Uh, 
a multitude of species, most notably the snapping shrimp or the pistol shrimp, things like that, uh, that live almost like a beehive uh, with one reproducing queen. And that's literally all she does. Uh, it's like the movie Aliens. All she does is just sit there uh, and just pump out in massive quantities, fertilized offspring. Those offspring will be assigned roles, uh, most notably, obviously, collecting food and things like that. Uh, but that one, at least, is probably relevant in your mind if you think of a beehive. The rest of these get a little tricky. Uh, there's a multitude of shrimp species that are what we call protandric hermaphrodites. This is where, uh, and this is as far as hermaphroditism goes, uh, this is the most common form out there. It's where, when you're going to start as male and later becomes female. This is important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it means that you stay genetically viable and relevant to your population no matter your age. Second of all, uh, this is a naturally occurring process. If you have the genetics to become male, and again, guys, we're way outside of that XY spectrum now. Um, if you have the genetics when you're born, let's say you're XY, because uh, that's the, the human equivalent to the male. Uh, as you get older, that Y kind of starts to fade. Uh, it, it's not as dominant anymore. We're losing testosterone. Uh, instead of becoming just a sterile male, it makes a lot more sense for nature to say, hey, you can be a male as long as you have testosterone, but when that quits, you're going to revert back to a female. Uh, so this is a very common model we'll see. There's another group now, uh, and these are functional hermaphrodites. This is where uh, you've got those, again, we'll use XY, but it's light years beyond that. Um, you've got XY, but if the social parameters or the society that you're living in uh, dictates it, you can reproduce as both. Uh, I also, I always tiptoe around how to word these things. Uh, in today's world, the idea of reproducing as one or both, it's not a gender switch. It's just the ability to produce those gametes, respectively. Uh, if you're an entirely uh, male population, all you're going to do is you still got the male genetics, but you're just going to produce eggs instead. Uh, it's got it's it's not a uh, a gender switch. Um, and I feel like very often hermaphrodites get confused with that. Uh, it's whatever gametes you're producing. Uh, most of these animals don't have the necessary sexual organs uh, to kind of determine a gender. Uh, it's whatever gametes you're producing at that time. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, the, I'm gonna put a little asterisk down here. If you're a functional hermaphrodite, it means you can and again, usually you started off as protandric, uh, this one, and retained the ability to produce sperm as an adult uh, and in later years. So you can produce either. It doesn't mean that you can self-fertilize most of the time, because of course, why wouldn't we have that little asterisk? Uh, usually this means you still are sexually reproducing, meaning you can meet either a male or female in your society and produce eggs or sperm respectively uh, to have genetically diverse offspring. There are some species, and we'll talk about this later. This is just the introduction section. Um, there are species that can do what we call self-fertilization, where you release both sperm and egg. They fertilize each other. Um, and again, I'm, this is like a, a teaser for you if, if this is at all interests you. <laughs> Um, believe it or not, through that self-fertilization, the species that exhibit that behavior uh, actually increase their genetic diversity by cloning themselves. Uh, so, like I said, you have to really kind of throw your mammalian knowledge out the window here. Uh, we're in a whole new ball game. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff, uh, unique traits and behaviors, but we know it's worked. It's It's been around forever. Uh, so... Yeah, it might be overwhelming now. Uh, we'll take baby steps uh, as far as explaining all these things. And they, all of these will pop up uh, both in later exams. 
uh, and later conversation and lecture. With uh, the actual reproduction, uh, usually we're going to have, again, kind of this strange dominance strategy almost. Uh, we see this most notably with fiddler crabs. Uh, I think they're arguably uh, one of the best examples of a very weird phenom we see uh, quite often in especially male animals. Uh, the large claw here serves a little to no function other than getting a mate. And then we've got our finesse claw here. Uh, Fiddler crabs are one of the best examples of a very interesting thing that happens uh, in reproductive biology of animals and not just inverts. Uh, does anybody know or can expand on uh, this very strange principle? So it's the handicap principle. It's something um, as like we take behavior or if you've taken behavior, you'll talk a lot about um, with signaling. And basically the handicap principle is that the male is like handicapped by whatever he has developed to attract the female. And because of that, it is less likely that he would be kind of deceitful with it, more so that it would be like an honest signal. Um, what's crazy about like all of this is like, you know, with peacocks, like they're probably the most prime example of the handicap uh, you know, how heavy their tail is and whatnot, um, and that that's a pretty honest signal, you know, their tail is heavy, they have to hold it up. Whereas with fiddler crabs, like, that claw is really heavy, and for that male to develop, you know, a big claw, and he's one fight, so he's going to be attractive to females. However, if they lose it and were to regrow it, it regrows hollow, so it becomes a dishonest signal. But that's where the idea of the handicap principle comes in, is that all the males are going to view it like, oh, wow, he has, you know, a huge claw. It's got to be heavy. He has all this strength. You know, males are less likely to mess with him or they'll assume like he's going to win. He's stronger and females are going to be attracted to him when in reality, you know, it's it's hollow and it's light because he has lost a fight. And now he's dishonest in his signaling because everyone assumes that he's like some big bad male who's just beat everyone up and he's been able to grow this claw so big because it's hollow. So yeah, the handicap principle is really cool actually. Yeah. Uh, excellent example. And I'm so glad you brought up the fact that after they lose it, it comes back hollow and it's a, a fake. It'd be like uh, the equivalent of a peacock, a male peacock getting spray painted. Um, it's a shallow attempt at best. Uh, to still impress mates. Uh, this is, I don't know, I don't know what's cool nowadays, guys. Uh, this is like the equivalent of going to the gym but skipping leg day, I guess. Uh, you want to have something to show off, but the time and investment that goes into it is truly a detriment. That's why it's called a handicap. Um, it's a detriment to the animal itself. I think that the cool lesson to take from the fiddler crab is for me personally this animal embodies everything that gets thrown around cliche as far as evolution survival of the fittest uh, passing on your genetics uh, this is what it looks like people um, this is the most important thing in all evolutionary history whatever it takes to get a mate and pass on your genetics um, that's all evolution dictates is necessary. Like survival of the fittest, uh, as we just heard, that could mean losing a claw and growing a fake hollow. It'd be like having a, a pillow in your bicep area to make you appear larger. All that matters is that you get a date uh, and get to pass on your genetics. Um, so there are like imposters out there, but I think the fiddler crab really highlights how important um, survival of the fittest really uh, translates because it's not like, the, the claw itself is it's completely stupid like it's worthless uh, and the fact that an animal would dedicate this many nutrients and this much of its life to basically dragging this thing around uh, really shows like hey it might be annoying now uh, but I'm gonna get I don't know which way you swipe 
I'm gonna get swiped left or right, whichever's good. Uh, and just, it's a, it's a, this picture right here is like a visual representation of what is important as far as evolution. Uh, uh, completely now hollow after you've lost your first fight because you weren't as strong as you thought. Uh, hollow attempt to still attract a mate and still pass on your genes, uh, despite the fact that outside of that interaction, uh, you're dragging around a completely worthless instrument uh, that, that can't help you later in life. As far as some of the reproductive biology that comes up, uh, we do have another strange occurrence uh, and with crabs, most notably. Um, the process here uh, really ties into the fact that Again, remember now we, we've got that shrunken in abdomen. We don't have uh, necessarily access to the reproductive portals uh, that we would see in maybe your lobster species or things like that. Uh, because we have that folding in, with the exoskeleton being present, it can make breeding difficult on time. Uh, the copulation process in courtship can be very quick or last weeks. Uh, the fascinating stuff we see here, uh, and maybe some of you, if you like crab romance, uh, will find this romantic. Uh, a lot of the times uh, with a multitude of crab species, uh, the male and female interact with one another, maybe he's competed for her, but then he picks her up and he will carry her around. Um, the Female releases pheromones into the water stream uh, that indicate she's about to not only become reproductively viable, uh, but also about to molt. And this is important uh, for, the, for the mating process, because again, picture that exoskeleton being removed. Um, I don't know any PG way to approach how to describe this. If the hardened exoskeleton has been removed, uh, we've got access to the reproductive organs now, uh, and they're only going to be able to mate during that molting process, after the molting process. Uh, as the adult female is onto the new molt, basically, that exoskeleton is going to start hardening me again. Uh, she can't control that. She can control when she molts, uh, send off the pheromones as a signal, uh, but that's about it. And this is what we call a soft shell form. Uh, it's funny to bring it up because uh, I think a lot of you have probably had or know somebody who's talked about it. Anybody from Boston will talk your ear off about it. But what are we really looking at when we say soft shell crab? So a lot of people think soft shell crabs are um, their own species, but really what it is, is a, a crab who has literally just molted, fresh molt, you know, got brand new glowing skin or or what have you. And, uh, you know, and then once they're, once they're pulled from the water, or once they molt, a lot of harvesters will pull them from the water because the water and the salinity within the water um, and anything that the crab has retained that's salt related <laughs> will is what helps the the shell or the exoskeleton harden and it typically takes i think about four days for the shell to be absolutely um back to its typical hardness but um yeah i mean even i want to say a soft shell crab can be considered it could be considered um, anywhere from a fresh, fresh molt to about 24 hours, 48 hours? No, 24 hours-ish. Um, and then after that, it becomes unable to be sold as a soft-shelled crab because then, then it gets like kind of leathery. And But yeah. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and the, the timing is spot on. It's always weird to me. Um, and again, I hope I didn't offend anybody who's from Boston and does love soft shell crab. Uh, it's considered like such a delicacy. It's literally the exact same crab you could have gotten at Joe's Crab Shack. It just molted. It shed its skin. Um, 
think think about it logically like nature wouldn't make a soft shelled crab uh it's their most vulnerable time uh they're very subject to predation or injury uh while that exoskeleton is still hardening uh, and again as, as was mentioned uh ocean water is going to take care of a lot of that it, it's kind of like forging something in the fire like ocean water dictates you have to have this exoskeleton now uh and I don't know. I just always think it's funny the idea that uh, and I, I know somebody said it earlier. Uh, there's not a species of soft shell crab that makes no sense. Like, does it come with its own batter and deep fry oil? Like, no. You're talking about a regular crab, uh, usually blue crabs, uh, to be honest, are probably what's used the most. Um, but that means that you've got your chef that has to sit there and watch the tank all day. And as soon as the female is going to mate, uh, she sheds and then instead of mating we pull her out and throw in her deep fryer uh, male, males also can be used it's just whenever the animal molts uh, but that's just an example but yeah this idea of a soft shell crab uh, it, it's silly and it doesn't exist the <clears throat> again dating process i guess is kind of cute uh, as soon as that female release re releases the uh, hormones and the pheromones uh, that she's going to molt and then be reproductively viable. Uh, the male will uh, sometimes uh, pick her up. Sometimes they invert them. So they're carrying them piggyback style on their back. Uh, sometimes they'll just drag her around, but they basically link up as a couple. Uh, and then it's just a waiting game until she molts. Uh, they're able to reproduce uh, and th then they will separate as a couple. The overlying rule um, is, and again, we have to consider the dendro breaks here. Uh, the decapods as a whole, though, if we exclude them, because uh, we know they're broadcast spawners, uh, consists of basically moving uh, the pleopods, which again are commonly called the swimmerettes. Uh, these are the tiny moving parts, usually on the telson or the abdomen at the very least, uh, consist of holding the fertilized eggs uh, on the pleopods and circulating water through them the whole time. Uh, they have to have clean oxygenated water, because uh, again, we've got gelatinous or mucosal uh, eggs here. They need to have that influx of oxygen. And with that, of course, comes the release of waste out of those eggs. Uh, once the eggs have reached maturity and they're ready to hatch, uh, the female, whatever organism we're talking about, uh, let's just take a lobster, for example, uh, really starts to vigorously shake this mass. And it not only um, releases these now fertilized, uh, mature offspring off into the water, uh, it also helps kind of, I guess, break the shell is a good example. Uh, it's, it, there's obviously no shell, it's mucosal, uh, but this very violent uh, movement kind of shakes all the mucus off these animals. Uh, they're not only spread and dispersed evenly, uh, but they're also, again, kind of broken out of their shell. The last part we have here, aside from just keeping the eggs uh, maintained and circulating water through, uh, we do have a bit of uh, maternal care. This comes usually uh, from terrestrial animals. Uh, your terrestrial decapods are known to lay their eggs in bromeliads. Most of you, I know it's like a huge trend now, uh, which I'm very proud of, by the way. Uh, huge trend now to keep uh, house plants. Uh, and a lot of the times when you're starting off, you usually start off with what you may or may not know is a bromeliad. Uh, we call them water catching plants, uh, usually easier to take care of for your novice gardener, um, but they do exactly that. They're gonna preserve and contain water. Uh, your adult terrestrial crabs uh, are going to lay their eggs. Offspring develops very quickly in this case. Uh, we don't have the, the wait time and the, the leisure of growing our offspring. Uh, so they're gonna develop quickly and <clears throat> Females will return to that bromeliad and either bring food. They've also been observed uh, depositing unfertilized eggs for their offspring to eat. 
Uh, so you have a batch that is fertilized, deposit that in a bromeliad, uh, and come back uh, and deposit uh, a food source for them uh, using your own internal resources. The influence and uh, effect they've had on humans, I don't think it's been realized yet. And please, you don't have to go out in the world and quote this. Um, I do think we're gonna see something come from this eventually. Uh, the decapod consumption as far as a food source, uh, I don't think the devastating effects we've done to our environment have been felt by everyone yet. Um, and please, I'm, I'm not telling you like, if you had a date at Red Lobster or Joe's Crab Shack after this, like I'm, I'm not telling you to cancel your date. Uh, I do think that in the future, uh, we're gonna see some negative side effects to the consumption of all these decapod species because, and we talked about this a million times too with um, bioaccumulation, they're literally like bottom dwelling sponge creatures that absorb anything and everything in that environment. Uh, we're bioaccumulating toxins ourselves uh, by consuming these animals or being even aligned with them. Uh, I think unless we clean up the ecosystems these animals are living in, like it, it doesn't make sense to have them as a staple part of the human diet. And I, I'm not going off on a tangent here. The same thing could be said for all farmed animals. Um, this is kind of like the version of like free range, uh, grass fed, wagyu beef type thing. Um, I, I do think that in our lifetimes, we're going to see a, a negative side effect uh, to what we've done to the ecosystem and then dragging animals out of it and eating them. Uh, yeah, there's, there's got to be something. Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I actually was reading that when I was uh, looking into the whole soft shell thing at first, um, I was reading where and um, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody because I grew up with with less than more. So, um, but lobster and crab used to be considered the quote unquote, not my words, poor man's dinner. Yeah, um, it was food. But it, but then it turned into, um, you know, kind of more of a, uh, if the more money you have, the more you can afford to to have a luxurious lobster dinner or crab dinner, you know. Um, so I just, I really think that. When you said, you know, you're basically eating bottom dwellers, and I totally agree. I mean, people eat catfish, and as long as you take the mud vein out, it's okay. But I mean, essentially, those, those, uh, or, or the, their food sources are going directly into their their muscle meat that we're eating, or like their innards <laughs> that we're eating, um, and along with that, uh, bouncing back to the soft shell crab, a lot of people like an old wives tale will say that the dead man's fingers which is in reference to the the gills i believe uh it looks like when you open up the the crab it looks like fingers um i think they're blue mm -hmm. i'm not sure but uh a lot of people in the old, old wives tales days thought that th they were poisonous the, the dead man's fingers and would request for them to be cleaned they're not poisonous um, they're not really harmful, but they don't taste very good. Like I think I read they have a chemical taste, but same with like the quote unquote mustard part of the crab or any, nope. any you know, crustacean that you're consuming. Um, you gotta, there. it's basically like the mud vein in a catfish, you know, people, people like it there. It's a delicacy, but it comes with its drawbacks. You're eating a bottom dweller. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so glad that was brought up. Uh, it's an awesome way to kind of end with some cool slightly horrifying but fun trivia yeah uh lobster was like and again um not trying to uh poke fun or like make light of the plight some people are going through uh they literally would give lobster away to like homeless shelters like it was a, a, a poor person's food like lobster ew get that mud bug out of here uh very interesting and I'd, I'd like to shake the hand of whatever chef came along and they were like how about we add butter to it? Uh, and all of a sudden it's a $40 uh, menu item. Whoever did that, bravo. Uh, but yeah, it, it was considered a bottom dweller and literally nothing's changed. Like if anything, our ecosystems have gotten significantly 
uh, worse. The stigma and the, the aura surrounding lobsters uh, in general, crabs too, uh, but yeah, you're still looking at an animal that's done nothing its whole life but consume every toxin-laden uh, protein available to them. Uh, and again, guys, like I I'm really not trying to come off as like, it's time to go uh, vegan, vegetarian type stuff. Like, trust me, you, you, if you think I'm going to say no to a lobster meal, like I'm in. But I also want to be conscious of what I'm doing to my body. Uh, and yeah, like the, the preparation, uh, the, the cleanliness uh, surrounding these animals is really hard to manage. Um, so yeah, just I, I don't care if you go eat a lobster, but know what you're getting into. Like, and also make sure it's lobster. sustainably sourced. Sorry. Yes. No, a hundred percent. Trust me, when we get uh, moving further along and we get to like salmon and things like that, I will talk for four days of the sustainability of salmon and whether you're really getting uh, fresh wilds caught versus farmed. Uh, there, there's a ton that goes into this. And honestly, none of this is meant to affect anyone's lifestyle or diet, certainly. Uh, I'm not a dietitian. I'm just saying, uh, be conscious of, like, look at the videos of, uh, like, the plastic oceans we have, uh, and then take that into consideration uh, when buying or cooking your own, uh, whether it's a decapod, uh, could be a cow, I, I don't care. Like, just look at what we're doing uh, and be conscious of it when you're putting that into your body. We are, unfortunately, and again, this is my opinion, not true. It's just, just me. Uh, I think we're really going to see effects of this uh, come up within our lifetime of, oh, yeah, we shouldn't have done that. Um, like, who knows, like McDonald's burgers type thing, which, again, I had one of those a couple of days ago. But it, it's just something to be aware of, guys. I'm not trying to change any of your behaviors. Just you need to be educated uh, and then make your decision going forward. So I'm glad we finished our Decapod lecture uh, talking about McDonald's. Uh, that, that feels right. Um, thank you, and we'll talk soon. Thanks.